John Carlin is joining us. Hey, John. John is the former Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice, and Glenn Gerstel is here as well. Glenn is, of course, former General Counsel at the NSA. It's nice to see you both, gentlemen. The deadline's ticking, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, only so many more shopping days left, right, before this new uh, SEC rule goes into effect, at least for, for large companies. So the, the rule goes into effect on December 18th, of this year, if you're for most companies, and then for certain smaller companies, it doesn't go into effect until June fifteenth of next year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start then with the big picture um, from the corporate board's perspective. What's changed recently, in addition, of course, to these new SEC rules? Um, I'd like to hear from both of you, Glenn. You maybe want to start us off for this one. Sure. Uh, and first, uh, thanks, uh, Suzanne, for setting this up. It's great to be on a panel with my former government colleague, John. Um, and uh, that that's exactly the right question because the, the details of the SEC rule are important, but we need to put them in, in context. And uh, I imagine John's probably gonna echo what, I, what I'm about to say, but um, as I talk to uh, corporate leaders, both on the executive level and the board level, um, I'm hearing uh, a, a sense that on one hand, there are a lot of positive developments. We, we can talk about those for a second or two, but the, develop, but, the, but the developments that are on the challenging or negative side and the trends in that area are accelerating and accumulating at a rate that are offsetting some of the good news. Let's just put this in context for a second and look at and talk about the good news for a second. Um, we just had a great panel with uh, CISA and, um, and the FBI, and that surely is one of the success stories we're now seeing that those two agencies, along with my former agency, the NSA, are issuing really useful directives, really helpful advisories that don't just tell you what problem you might have had, but how to prevent the next problem and how to deal with your current problem. So that that's a big, big step up in the way the government has been reacting in the cybersecurity area, and I think corporations appreciate that. Um, industry cooperation itself is at an all-time high. I think industrial leaders would say they're talking to their counterparts in their industry um, with within appropriate guidelines, of course, but there's a lot of sharing going on. Uh, every CISO and every board after the Ukraine invasion and the Russian threat and all these other uh, highly visible publicized uh, ransomware activities is fully aware of the cybersecurity threat. There, no, there's nobody who's not taking it seriously. That's a good thing. Uh, we're moving away to we're moving to more technical solutions to deal with cybersecurity, to multi multi factor authentication, pass keys, et cetera, et cetera. So so there's a lot of good things happening. That's unfortunately I think being outpaced by some of the negatives. And just to review them very quickly because they're all obvious, but I think putting them in context helps. Um, in no particular order, um, we're obviously seeing much more sophisticated ransomware actors who are ever more sophisticated with deeper consequences uh, to cyber incidents because <clears throat> we're seeing everything from double extortion, meaning the people are, the bad guys are exfiltrating data and then saying they're going to release it unless you not only pay the ransom to decrypt your system, but to prevent the data from uh, your customer's data, your tr proprietary secrets from being disclosed uh, publicly. Um, we're seeing C-suite harassment in the form of uh, emails and DDoS attacks and just a wide range of, of ever more sophisticated uh, uh, cyber maliciousness. The types of attacks themselves have changed uh, and they're, they're harder to defend against. Uh, obviously, we've all seen um, supply chain instances where you have trusted suppliers and it's very hard to deal with a situation in which the trusted supplier himself or itself has been infected by, uh, by one of the cyber bad guys. Um, cloud penetrations, AI uh, generated phishing emails. We could go down the list of how the types of attacks have gotten uh, worse and harder to defend against. In that context, the sort of long predicted feared shift of uh, targets from uh, information technology to operational technology is now underway. We're in the midst of it. Um, we all know that uh, OT and IOT devices, industrial sensors aren't built in with the same level of security. They can't be protected the same way that with firewalls, et cetera. You can't really have a backup necessarily the way you can for information. Um, so that exposes some interesting vulnerabilities. And interestingly, the point I'd make there is that um, unlike in the IT area where the really big companies, the say the Fortune 200 are, are in pretty good shape, 
in this area, everybody's uh, almost equally vulnerable. A big defense contractor that may have a fabulous solution for their IT vulnerabilities is very much vulnerable as, as a mid-market company might be in the, in the OT area. Finally, just very quickly, uh, geopolitical developments are, are uh, ac accentuating in a, in a negative way. Uh, when I was at the National Security Agency, I saw this steady evolution, but it's now uh, reached a very significant point with at least three countries, Iran, North Korea, um, and Russia, really acting with impunity in this area. There's very little to constrain them. There's China is still a very, very big negative actor, but there are some constraints on its behavior, not the case with the others. We're seeing, for example, Hamas and Iran join together in targeting Israeli technology that happens to be used in U.S. water systems. So in effect, Iran is, I'll say, getting away, not literally, but getting away or certainly having a, uh, some success in, in going after U.S. water utilities. And then finally, just very quickly, other challenges that we all know about, uh, continued talent challenges in this area. And then finally, and the one we're going to be talking about is more regulation so that there's um, there's, there's a, just a lot more compliance risk. I think very quickly, the consequence of all this is that cyber now pervades every aspect of a company's business and operations and reputation and market share. Um, it used to be something that maybe five and 10 years ago, we were able to quantify as a specific risk, say like the risk of a fire at a plant. That's no longer the case. I'm sure John would agree and, and amplify this, but this is a completely all pervasive uh, existential issue that boards now have to recognize as such. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great rundown of uh, some of the challenges that these companies are facing right now, uh, Glenn. That's fantastic. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, you spend a lot of time with boards. Uh, they know what a lot of these risks are. If they don't, it's going to be too late by the time they wake up to them. Um, how are some of the recent SEC rules uh, coming into play? And, and how are these boards thinking about kind of balancing these things out? Yeah, and it's, it's great to be back uh, talking to you, Suzanne, and it's nice to see the uh, the way in which you raise awareness of these issues, both the changes in technology, the way threat actors are exploiting it, and what companies need to think about. So interesting on the SEC rule is this is a, this is an instance where I actually think the draft rule, which uh, contains, but I'll, I'll just put my cards on the table, some misguided provisions, including a provision that would have required members of the board to have certain specified cybersecurity expertise, which would be quite unusual and also, I think, not entirely in keeping with the role of the board, which is not, of course, to be operationally handling the, def uh, the defense of a system or even day-to-day -day handling the risk, but providing this uh, overall uh, oversight and relying on the business judgment of its executive. So, that discussion, uh, along with other provisions in the draft rule that did not get included in the rule that was actually passed in July, did, I think, encourage uh, a positive effect of it, and I'm glad that they didn't go into effect, was that it increased the attention that boards are paying to this area, and you've seen a couple trends in terms of change in practice. So one is ensuring, to your point, Suzanne, on being, keeping apprised of the threats, and the threats do change, the threat actors change, the methods change, uh, that they get briefed quarterly both on uh, to ensure that they, this is for pub uh, large publicly held companies, but to ensure that both they know what the threats are and therefore what the risk environment is for the company, and that they also get briefed on what the approach and plan is and where there's uh, still steps le left to take so they can make an informed risk decision. And you know, as this group knows well, this is not, there is no solution. So there's no you know, wall you can build that's high enough or moat you can dig that's deep enough to keep a dedicated adversary out of your system. Offense outstrips defense and a dedicated adversary can get in. So it's a question of what, what's the right investment in terms of having in-depth protection so that you could detect and quickly address once that bad guy, be they a nation state, a criminal, uh, criminal group, hacktivist, is inside the system. And then also resilience, say uh, the worst happens, you, you suffer a business interruption event, you know, what type of measures have you taken in order to store data offline in a pristine shape that you could get operating systems back up and running? Have you tested the, and so often I see a gap actually uh, with clients, have you tested the ability to actually take what you think is that uh, backup of data and run uh, run your systems post 
post attack. And so when you look at the new rule, you have these quarterly briefings that are taking place. Another question that, that came up with boards is, do I have it assigned to the right committee? What should my structure look like? I'm getting a lot of questions along those lines. So I think traditionally a lot of boards had it either as a uh, an area of risk for the entire board to manage or it was assigned to the audit committee. A lot of audit committees are seeing with the increased threat, attention, and as Glenn said, the way it permeates every aspect of the business, they got a lot else on the plate on the audit committee. And so they're experimenting with creating either new committees um, you know, around AI, privacy, other technology risks, or they already have an existing technology risk that may have been more product uh, focused, but they're placing the cybersecurity risk into that area. So I don't think there is a prescribed right now by the SEC or otherwise place uh, you know, governance rule as to which committee needs to handle the risk. But having that conversation and showing you've been thoughtful about where you where you place the risk is important. And then finally, with the new SEC rule that's coming into effect, there's really two parts of it, just to get, uh, get a little more in, in the weeds of it. So one is a new rule as to what to do when you've suffered an incident and you're responding to it and what your disclosure obligations are. And the second part of it, the so-called 10K, is what you need to disclose in your steady state, absent an incident. And there are changes in both of those areas. Again, not such draconian changes as people were anticipating based on the draft rule. So on the what to do if there is an incident, they've codified what I, I think was already, uh, if you had experienced counsel in this space, you already were getting the advice based on a 2011 and 2018 circular from the SEC and the way we've been seeing them. And I've seen them try to do enforcement with with clients. So it codifies in rule and it defines a cybersecurity incident. It has quite a broad definition of cybersecurity incident. Again, not as broad as the draft rule though, because the draft rule said that it might be a material uh, incident that required disclosure to your shareholders. And the new rule says it has to be within four days of your determination that it's material. The draft rule said, uh, that that could include a series of unrelated events. And a lot of us were scratching our heads on, well, how, how exactly are you <laughs> going to have uh, you know, a uniform approach to determining materiality of unrelated small incidents? The new rule at least uh, says that they it's either a major incident or a series of related incidents. That's still undefined, and I'm getting a lot of questions about how to apply that in practice, but it's better than unrelated. <laughs> uh, and so that you know, there's a question of it can't mean, let's say, spear phishing, um, or that or, or would that would hit the entire Fortune 500, uh, who have a, a number of incidents. Could it mean something like the same vulnerability has been exploited? And so you know, if you're selling a product, that'll lead us, I think, Glenn, to I know something you wanted to touch on, which is so, uh, solar winds. Exactly what does that mean? So that's if you have an incident, and then just to cover the landscape. The other part on the 10K is requiring a much more specific disclosure. Again, I think consistent with where they were headed anyway, but they're really saying you can't put anything in the hypothetical. So mm -hmm. you, and this again, I think will actually hit like the entire Fortune 500, if not the Fortune 1000 of public companies. So instead of saying, you know, you might have a, a cyber incidents or cyber incidents are a potential risk, you're gonna have to say you've had had cyber incidents and probably get into what I think you'll end up seeing is a is a default laundry list disclosure approach that becomes essentially market. And in that sense, not to be cynical, but I'm not sure is that helpful to the public or to the shareholders and then discerning what is the actual difference in risk for uh, the, dif uh, the different sectors, but it will you know, reduce legal risk for those companies. So those are the two big categories. Yeah, and the definitions are so important here. Go Suzanne? ahead, Yeah. Yeah, can I add a, a footnote to what John said too? Yes, of course. Um, uh, so not surprisingly, I agree with uh, John's comments and, and sharp analysis. Uh, on the um, on the question of, of board compositions, I, I, I concur that uh, we've seen a bunch of boards uh, uh, direct cybersecurity responsibility to their audit committees, 
Um, that was clearly the case for MGM Resorts, which had which said that their audit committee was the committee that was responsible for cyber, um, with apparently some rather negative consequences for them, be given the nature of the hit they took. Uh, their their audit committee, it turned out, did not really have deep cyber expertise. That's not surprising. Most audit committees are focused on financial issues, not so much uh, cyber issues. And I think we're seeing a trend away from audit committees and moving to new, as John said, new digital committees, broader committees that have overall cyber and technology risk assigned to them with, with hopefully some experts uh, on the board in that area. Uh, there was a recent study that said that some close to, I think, 88% of um, the Fortune, uh, I'm sorry, of the S&P 500 did not have cyber expertise on their board. Still, still a very, very substantial gap. Um, how boards uh, look at this going forward is going to be an, an, an important and evolving issue. And then secondly, on the materiality point, John made some, some great the comments there. Um, uh, you know, I think most uh, disclosure lawyers, whether they're in-house or out or, or an outside law firm, such as in John's, uh, you know, they're really experienced with making these materiality determinations. I don't think it's that's necessarily all that intrinsically difficult. Um, it's made worse in the cyber area because of two things. One, the point John made, which is that these cyber incidents may be evolving and fluid. There's no one particular incident that occurs. It may be a series of things and it may not look material at the beginning, but may um, um, later on. And then secondly, uh, they're often hard to quantify. Uh, if, you, if you're a, in a business where there's a say a, a hurricane wipes out one of your plants, you can figure out exactly what percent of your product was manufactured at that plant, and you can come up with some pretty hard numbers as to what the loss is. But what's the loss if you have a reputational problem where some of your data is leaked? How do you assign a dollar value to the loss of, of confidence in your company? So admittedly, there are some tricky aspects to this. Yeah, and John, I'm sorry. I think um, you were trying to jump in there with a comment. Oh, I apologize. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. It was actually it was going to be a question for Glenn because uh, Glenn was encouraging that there be um, someone with expertise in this area on a board. And that actually, there was a, in the draft rule, there was a proposal to mandate that there be someone with that expertise. That was stripped. And I was curious whether Glenn thinks that was rightly stripped from the rule or thinks that the rule should have required it. Well, I certainly think it's it's right for uh, there to be some disclosure of the nature of cybersecurity expertise at the board level. That, to me, sounds like something investors uh, should should be entitled to know. Um, whether I would not, however, go so far as to mandate that there be one or two or X numbers of people who have designated cybersecurity expertise. I think this is all part of the business judgment issue that you re referred to beforehand. And also, I think... Uh, Maybe this is a bit exaggerated, but I think there's a danger that if you get one person who is the cybersecurity man or woman on the board, uh, that the board will say, well, that's great. That's going to be handled by Joe or John or Sam or Debbie or whoever. Um, and it, this really is, to going back to my earlier point, I know you concur with this, this is a whole board issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, John, assuming uh, assuming you agree with that, it, it, you mentioned, um, and I want to go back to this just really quickly because I think this resonates with so many folks. But you mentioned Solar Winds, uh, that enforcement case that certainly got everyone's attention. Uh, what do you think the lessons to be learned from that are, and are, are you still sharing those lessons with clients, you know, even X number of years now post Solar Winds? Yeah, well, um, some of the lesson of Solar Winds is brand is relatively new. Uh, mm -hmm. months rather than years because of the enforcement action that they've brought, not just against the company, but personally against the chief information security officer. And so if you were to ask me which is likely to have a greater impact or is causing more of a, a, a buzz within the industry within C uh, for chief information security officers, for reporting structures, it's that enforcement action rather than the rule. And the enforcement action came before the rule but I think gives you some sense of how they're interpreting it and why they're putting the new rule into effect. And for those who may be less familiar with it, SolarWinds itself is essentially providing a back-end product that companies, I think 499 of the Fortune 500 companies used SolarWinds in, uh, or a tool of SolarWinds in some capacity. That uh, tool was compromised by Russian intelligence services that, by the way, that fact is nowhere mentioned in the SEC um, complaint. But you know, the fact that it's a sophisticated nation-state actor, I think, should get 
uh, should get our attention. And quite a caveat for our group, which is I was brought in to represent the cybersecurity company who, uh, through the backdoor vulnerability, was hacked by the Russian intelligence services, this company Mandiant, that subsequently was uh, acquired by Google, at the time it was FireEye Mandiant. And they were the ones who discovered and reverse engineered the code and then provided that to SolarWinds, which is included in the complaints because the SEC has a, a, a couple of um, key areas that they find wanting and this will be litigated. So one, they, uh, they say in terms of the disclosures post-incident that some of those disclosures were phrased in the, uh, in the hypothetical, in the possible. So they said that this vulnerability you know, possibly could have been exploited by bad actors to hit these victims. Interestingly, you know, for those of us, and I know Glenn is one who've been in this space, it's not every day you see an 8K disclosure that causes a 16% drop in share price, and then the SEC to say it wasn't fulsome enough that it should have been even uh, kind of more damaging disclosure. So that's fairly, uh, fairly unusual. And then I think what's gotten the chief information security officer community so concerned, along with a criminal prosecution against a former chief security officer for Uber, uh, J Joe Sullivan, is their sense that some of the activities that are described in the complaint were the chief information security officer on things like this, webinars, podcasts, other public statements saying, I think security is really important. Uh, I think we have good security practices when internally, both he and other members of his team, again, this is just according to the, uh, to the allegations in the SEC's complaint, were saying that there, needed, that there were improvements that needed to be made. And they had a security statement, which I think this would be true, and Glenn, you know, I don't know if you say, but even for the National Security Agency, is that you put out security statements that, although they are phrased as your existing policy, you know at the time that you put them out that you're not living 100%, it's, it's an aspirational policy, but they're saying that putting that out, knowing that you're not at 100% compliance is misleading and you need essentially to put the, to put the caveats in, uh, I'll give an example that's you know, been true for most every organization I work with, there's, there's a requirement to use multi-factor authentication to use your username, password, plus something else, and you almost always find that someone somewhere in the company is not doing that and it is not enabled. Here, you know, under the logic, at least as it's laid out, and I know that this was, you know, there's some extenuating circumstances of the case, but under the logic that's laid out, that would be misleading to your shareholder or to your customer. You'd have to say, we believe in multi-factor authentication, but we only have a 72% adoption rate or some caveat. Glenn, what do you think of it? Well, I agree, John. I think it's very problematic. Um, uh, you know, sort of follow up on your point, I, I think in talking to some people, uh, CISOs and board members and others, um, I think there's a danger both of underreacting and overreacting to the enforcement action, uh, which I agree is uh, clearly uh, problematic on le many levels. But on the underreacting side, I'm hearing some language like, oh, this is just the SEC sending a message. It doesn't really apply to me. These were an egregious set of facts. I don't really need to worry about it. Uh, this was an unusual situation at Solar Winds where they were ignoring lots of red flags and issuing uh, seemingly misleading uh, uh, pronouncements to, to the investor public. And so they're sort of downplaying the significance of this. I think you could be going down a wrong path with under uh, underappreciating the significance of it. By the same token, I think it's important to not overreact to the case. And I've heard some uh, lawyers uh, who are perhaps a little excessively conservative in this area saying, gosh, I'm worried about my clients um, uh, having internal documentation about their own deficiencies. And this, this is going to put a chilling effect on reporting deficiencies and problems because we don't want someone with 2020 hindsight, such as the SEC, coming back and saying, oh, you knew all along that you had these problems and here's 10 memos that show it. So you certainly want to have the right balance of managing this risk of making sure that you do have internal reporting and documentation and analysis and full assessments of your own internal weaknesses, including as appropriate disclosing them. And yet at the same time, um, you want to be careful that you're not you're not overdoing it and creating a paper trail that someone's going to look back on in the litigation and, and accuse you of of being um, uh, either misleading or incompetent or or 
even worse, criminally negligent. So this is an, an important area to, to, to get right. And I think, I, need, I think you're correct in pointing out, John, um, the, the, the pitfalls in this area. Yeah. You know, it's um, kind of a broader point, and I think you touched on it in your opening remarks, Glenn, but we're still seeing this uh, governmental schizophrenia where on the one hand, you have really increased resources, dedication from the top, from the Department of Homeland Security, from NSA, the National Security Agency, from the FBI, uh, from the Justice Department saying companies are victims and we are going to not re-victimize them, but make sure that we do what we can under our legal authorities to share information, to help them be resilient, to help them respond to incidents, and at the Justice uh, and FBI in particular, go after the bad guys and put pain where the pain should be, you know, do things like hack back. And so if so, legally, uh, and so if someone uh, pays a ransom, go steal the ransom back or steal the key that's being used to do decryption along with more traditional tools like arrests or just plain disrupt the services that are used to attack victims. So that's one side and that message is trying to get out there. Confusing that message, we're coming from the, uh, you know, the exact opposite, are a lot of regulators who are, I know from the perspective of private companies and clients, they are more afraid of the regulator than the criminal. And they uh, feel that if there's an incident and if they're public about the incident, that the goal of the regulator is going to be to maximize harm on the company, even when they took some you know, reasonable steps or, or was a grave threat actor. And I think you know, for this group, who's so informed and so persuasive, well, one thing I would hope, at least on the regulatory front, is that we had better conversations between and among the, the regulators so that the definitions um, and that the regimes were made to be consistent with each other. And I say that as a statement against interest because the current system is absolutely fantastic for both criminals and lawyers uh, who, uh, there's no way to navigate it without without a lawyer, but I don't think that's the best policy space for it to land in. Yeah, good good uh, good job insurance though. Uh, let me just in our in our final closing moments here, gentlemen. Let me just ask you both: What are some of the key points that you're really suggesting that boards follow now um, to address the cybersecurity risk today? Okay, well, I'll start rattle off a few, and then Glenn to close. Uh, so yeah. one, uh, I think you, you should have quarterly uh, briefings. You should know who your chief information security officer is. You should be able to understand them. If you do not understand them, then someone else needs to be briefing, briefing you. I would not say you don't need to be the, become the technical expert. They need to learn how to speak the language of boards and business risk. Yeah. You should get briefed by outside experts, both on what the threat is and also so that you understand the questions that are appropriate for a board member to ask. So you can again get and push on that, uh, that business risk question. You are still entitled to rely on business judgment, but that means you know, making sure you understand the, the qualifications and the expertise of your uh, executive team. And then I think Glenn was getting at uh, this as well. Don't just think of it as a risk, but an opportunity. Make sure you understand how cybersecurity nests within your overall digital strategy. Yeah, that's great, Glenn. Yeah, well, um, once again, I would uh, sign on to everything John said. Uh, not surprising. Um, uh, I, I don't think um, you can. We can overemphasize the fact that the cybersecurity vulnerabilities are uh, pervade all aspects of a company's business and operations. Uh, uh, it's every and so when when a board or executive uh, level uh, officers are looking at anything from human resources, the payroll department, uh, operations, the factory floor, whatever. Um, cyber has to be taken into account, and that's that's a sort of a new phenomenon, relatively speaking. Um, but but I don't think we can overemphasize that. I think getting cyber expertise on boards is critically important. I don't necessarily think that government has to mandate that, uh, but the boards, for their own sake and to, as John said, to fulfill their business judgment uh, responsibilities, are going to need to have significant cyber expertise on the board. And then finally, uh, to John's point also, I would say this duality is going to be with us, which is on one hand, the government is uh, taking steps to promote cybersecurity, and yet at the same time, they're 
coming with a stick against companies that aren't uh, uh, seemingly fulfilling their mandates in this area. That duality isn't going to change. Regulators are going to continue to get uh, more involved in this area. That trend is not, not abating. Um, and I think we just have to recognize that's the reality and, and prepare for it. Yeah, gentlemen, excellent advice here um, and for free. So thank you both for that. That's always an added bonus. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to kind of walk through um, some of these rules, uh, the upcoming deadline, and then more broadly, just some of the same struggles that we've been dealing with and that boards have been dealing with for years now. It feels like more people are paying closer attention to them now uh, because they have to. Yep. Uh, but thank you both so much for being here. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.